Hello, and welcome to the first episode of The Tool Belt, a podcast designed to equip you with the tools you need to improve maintenance and reliability at your facility. I'm your host, Plant Services' own Alexis Kajewski, and in this podcast, we'll focus on new ways to manage, maintain, and automate your facility through in-depth interviews with a variety of subject matter experts and industry insiders. In today's episode, Thomas Wilk sits down with Donovan Tyndall, Senior Cybersecurity SME for Honeywell Connected Enterprise Industrial Cybersecurity. For over 20 years, Donovan has specialized in cybersecurity and infrastructure for control systems. Before we begin, I have a few quick announcements. We just launched the Plant Services Downloadables Library, which contains the latest market research, reports, and white papers you need to decrease downtime and improve metrics at your facility. Organized by type and topic, the library offers insights and advice from experts throughout the industry and across verticals. Visit plantservices.com slash downloads to access the library anytime from any device. Finally, a quick reminder that Smart Industry Basecamp registration is now open. Visit event.smartindustry.com to view the agenda, new speaker announcements, and register for the only event designed to deliver a step-by-step action plan for your organization's digital transformation. Smart Industry Basecamp will be held in Rosemont, Illinois, March 30th through April 1st, so don't miss it. Without further ado, here is today's discussion. Welcome to the Plant Services Tool Belt Podcast. This is Tom Welk, the Chief Editor on Plant Services. And today, our first podcast of 2020, we're welcoming Donovan Tyndall, the Senior Cybersecurity Subject Matter Expert for Honeywell Connected Enterprise. And he's here to talk with us today on industrial cybersecurity trends, both in a couple of previous years and what's coming next. So Donovan, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you for the invite as well. I, I enjoy this topic and you know, helping others and sharing lessons learned. And, you know, I hope to do that today as well. Oh, fantastic. Well, you know, uh, the first question will go kind of broad on this, which is, as the year 2020 starts, uh, this is middle of January as we're talking, what are the two or three things that are currently top of mind for cybersecurity professionals like yourself? Um, one of the first, and we're getting a lot of, you know, questions from customers and industry and we're seeing solutions developing and it's really the I would say visibility into OT security so being able to you know what are I'll kind of break that that down what visibility into OT security means so the foundational is just um, knowing what needs to be secured right you know asset discovery inventory um, Because right now, you know, I've been in many facilities where we are being asked to help secure OT cyber assets, you know, thing, you know, environmental monitoring, heat trace, DCS, SCADA, uh, et cetera. But first thing we have to do is we have to go find them. And it continues to be a very labor intensive exercise, uh, either because existing documentation is inaccurate or poor and so a lot of manual collection or physical inspection is what we have to do so we start there and so you know there's there's technology that's getting better and better to help uh, improve that and maintain it but you know that's still the some of the foundation once we identify what we need to secure with a larger goal of you know having visibility into OT cybersecurity is actually securing it, right? So let's take the example, we've discovered a, um, uh, maybe a electrical relay protection network that was really kind of isolated away at uh, an area of the facility and it's dealing with like uh, high voltage relays and uh, protection, et cetera. But now we need to secure it. So we need to know what software is on it. Um, You know, is there, patches available, could we harden it, are there settings we could remove, you know, and just even knowing um, what is on that device, having that visibility of what could be updated and are we behind or are we up to date, 
And then lastly, there's the, you know, we think about um, all the different domains that go into cybersecurity, and that's things like authentication and remote access and patching and hardening and monitoring and reporting. Like once you, you know, if we kind of put this all together, when we think about the visibility into OT or, you know, control system cybersecurity, we need to clearly identify what is the scope uh, that needs to be protected, you know, in inventory and collection. Then we need to harden it and determine, you know, are we secure? And then lastly, we need to stay on top of that and sustain that security uh, and have that visibility overall. And that's really continues to be a big challenge even as we move into 2020 because there's just so much variety in control systems infrastructure across all the different industries. So I would say that would be the first one. In your opinion, Donovan, are there are the solutions that are emerging, given that particular need, becoming more turnkey, or are you seeing that plant teams need to have a couple of experts even beyond the IT department uh, down there on, on the OT floor, whether it's operations or reliability, to have the conversations you're talking about? Yeah, there's, yeah, turnkey could mean many different things. You know, to mm -hmm. some it means come into my facility and discover everything for me and give me a report. But that rarely works because we're, you know, it's that sometimes it's uh, tribal knowledge about the system, the networks, how they're connected, what exists. And it's, you know, it's not just a single person that understands it all. Uh, you may use a tool or a script that helps you discover an asset, um, but it makes an inference or an educated guess on what it believes that endpoint to be. And it may show up as, you know, something of a particular OS. Well, you need somebody that from that facility to kind of take it to the end and say, um, no, no, th this is a, um, uh, maybe a revenue meter or a power meter that's connected into the network to say this is what it actually is. So you definitely need on-site expertise because you can't, you know, uh, somebody who deals with that uh, facility or location day after day. Okay. Well, and we kind of sidetracked from uh, your train of thought th first question. You mentioned you had a couple other top of mind issues uh, that we're facing the, uh, the cyber industry right now. Yeah. The next one, um, and this is really it's incident readiness. Um, and, and I take, you know, I, I build upon my experience and our team's experience doing cybersecurity vulnerability assessments and risk assessments and uh, penetration tests for these types of environments. And what we find is generally um, being ready for an incident has, you know, there's two things you have to be ready. One is having controls in place um, that reduce the probability of exploit. So that's, those are things that keep the bad guys out or keep the, the malware or um, keep, you know, uh, inappropriate use, right? So uh, like authentication, firewalls, antivirus, application whitelisting, um, these all reduce the probability of exploit. So that, you know, that's where this in, most industries have invested for the last 10 or 20 years, right? segmenting networks and firewalls. So it's very rare not to find firewalls and antivirus. However, if you want to be ready for an incident, the next thing you have to do is you need to have very strong detection and response capabilities because that is what reduces the severity of an impact. So the first, those the, the, the protective controls keep the bad guys out or the, the threat or whatever it may be. And if we really want to be ready, we want to be able to detect if we've been exploited or there's inappropriate use or some kind of suspicious behavior, and we want to respond as quick as possible. Um, and to give you an, a, kind of an example, you know, like if you were to talk about, say, a, a business or a pharmacy, um, if, if they invested, you know, I, I use this story, um, a pharmacy that invested heavily in, say, the, the, the doors and the, uh, the gates, et cetera, that keep, you know, uh, someone out of that pharmacy. And so they're, they've got a high degree of protective 
controls. So then, you know, but they've, maybe they've spent no money on monitoring inside of that building. So if some, let's say somebody were to get inside, the, there's a very, it's very difficult to be exploited and get inside that building. But if they don't have monitoring capabilities, they might have a total loss, right? So everything inside that pharmacy or that building could be taken away. But if we have detection and response capabilities, and maybe we spend less on the, the doors and the gates and all of those controls that keep the bad guys out, and we have a good detection and response capability, so yes, somebody gets in, but if you can have somebody respond and get rid of them as quick as possible, then the impact is actually less than if you didn't detect them at all. And the case applies to cybersecurity. So, you know, if we think about 2020 and incident readiness, um, some of the surveys that Honeywell has commissioned, as well as those I've monitored, the over 85% of organizations and individuals you ask have admitted to some type of cyber attack in the last 12 months. So you know the incidents are happening. And then in a different survey, if you, uh, when we asked which you know, had of your cyber attacks, um, half admitted that it actually impacted their operations. So then, yet most are not equipped to properly detect and respond. And that's why we hear about these stories about an attacker being inside a network for months at a time, because that's an indicator that they detection and response and you know, their incident readiness was poor at that time. So I'd put that as another priority as we move into 2020, is that, you know, chances high that an incident will occur and that we need to be ready for it and we can, we can get ready. You know, the, we're hearing a shift in that conversation too when the plant services editors get a chance to attend professional events and reliability and maintenance. Uh, we're hearing similar stories. I, I had no idea the number was that high in terms of the surveys that you quoted. I've been in session rooms where the speaker on this topic has asked who here in this room is able to raise your hand and admit to a compromise in your network security. And I, last year in one of those sessions, a good one third of the hands went up and a couple of people offered up that usually the attack was ransomware related where um, they either had to um, find money for the ransom uh, or more commonly they, say that they simply had to rebuild their servers. Um, and it was something that they took pride in, um, in being able to rebuild the server. They were ready for it. Um, but it, it's interesting to, that, as you say, the attack is so prevalent in plants these days. And so many are, are, are finding a way to admit that, yeah, they, they, they've experienced issues directly. Yes, definitely. They, I'm seeing a kind of a shift. You mentioned ransomware and, mm -hmm. um, and what I, there's kind of the drivers, when you hear storytelling about why somebody might want to get into a control system, you know, people used to think it was like hackers and script kiddies, you know, wanting to be nefarious. But there's actually motivations now. One of them is money, and that mm -hmm. is the primary driver behind ransomware, right? So now, um, whether you are a personal individual, a small business, or a large corporation, you know, everybody is a potential target for ransomware as long as you have the capacity to pay, right? So if they found the data you want or the endpoints you want, then you can be impacted. And we've heard of many large organizations being attacked. So that isn't going away, right? So ransomware will continue to be. And that puts, um, that's one of them. The other, and uh, just today, out of, um, United States CISA, there was an alert talking about um, kind of geopolitical motivations now and kind of national interests outside of our borders as another potential driver uh, towards the cybersecurity threat. So now when you take, you know, kind of the geopolitical state and then ransomware or the money behind it, you know, it actually puts corporations and critical infrastructure as being key targets, one, because of their impact and because of their, you know, their potential to pay, right? So there's, those are um, uh, key reasons why uh, that, that I don't see, uh, unfortunately, this subsiding. 
Hmm. And it's amazing to me how many open port 80s there are out there through which a bad actor might want to use a web browser software and simply uh, gain access to critical networks. Um, you know, I, we had an article about three months ago which outlined the responsibilities of the reliability engineer, the, the engineer that occupies that middle ground between operations and maintenance. Um, and as this person charted out the responsibilities of the reliability engineer, it turned out that this person was arguing a lot of these cybersecurity responsibilities were falling practically by default to the reliability job titles because reliability and cybersecurity wasn't exactly a fix-it problem, so it didn't naturally fall into maintenance, and it wasn't specifically an operator's problem, those who operate the assets. So um, the reliability engineers and managers were, were taking on the bulk of this work. So my question to you is, um, when it comes to your encounter with plant teams, how often do you find someone on that side of the company, whether it's uh, reliability or operations or maintenance? How often do you find that plants staff up with an expert on these issues or or maybe that person is a self-taught expert um that story is not uncommon it usually mm -hmm. starts out that you know cybersecurity or even the very basics of it such as you know patching or firewall management falls to existing staff and if it's mm -hmm. connected to or associated with the control system then it will fall you know, it's usually engineering, maintenance, operations, reliability teams. So, yeah, that's that's not uncommon. Um, but then as the – eventually we start hitting a threshold where now if we watch the technology that's gone into – that's going into or like even the modernization of control systems, we now see more advanced – it's not just like a – controllers and an HMI anymore, right? It's advanced networking, it's routers, it's firewalls, it's virtualization. You need to be an expert on Active Directory. You may need to know databases. You might have to be able to troubleshoot DCOM and OPC and uh, permissions and local Windows firewall. So you start hitting that threshold where it's like, okay, we've pr we start to saturate the, the knowledge and even the capacity of existing engineering and maintenance and what happens is it becomes you encounter these issues less and less and it becomes really difficult to be the expert on it all the time right you're mm. you know you know um and so what i'm starting to see is that there gets to a threshold it's like okay there's enough of a workload um that it's now time to either self-train or bring in an expert from IT or partner with IT. And actually, I've been asked, you know, which model works best? And there really is, I haven't really found one model works better than the other. What it all comes down to is the fundamentals of um, skills, trust, and relationship. So wherever that lies, right? So if the skills are within the engineering team or even within IT, um, and I have seen it where even IT individuals are brought over or, you know, asked to be brought in. But there's this level of trust and high communication that allows it to work well, right? And so it really um, – and then you can bring in, you know, rely on the IT organization or even a centralized engineering or OT organization to do firewall management for one or multiple facilities, um, to have a team to help with virtualization across multiple facilities or active directory or start as we're starting to see now the cybersecurity infrastructure like patching and whitelisting and network monitoring and you know um, security event logging having that you know it, it becomes it's too much for just the, the typical engineer wanting to do that and it may not be what they went to school for or what motivates them either, right? So career-wise, they may not always want to do that for the rest of their career. So yeah, I am seeing specialized individuals being brought in um, to help, I would say, bring that expert-level knowledge for the different facets of cybersecurity. 
You've talked about portable media like USBs, and I've been to enough Honeywell user group events that Honeywell has definitely developed some technology that can help prevent USB-related incidents. Could you talk a little bit about the issues that you see with portable media like that as it relates to cybersecurity? Yes, and because you know when we're dealing with the um, you know the maintenance teams and the reliability teams and the engineering teams that are going interacting with these control systems, there's still the fundamental need to move files and data, whether it's into the system or out of it. And right now, the primary technology is USB. And that happens to be one of the leading threat vectors for getting malware into the environment, right? So that's, you know, when we look back at a lot of incidents, that typically is how it's getting in. Either the existing engineering staff and maintenance and reliability staff or even contractors. And it's no longer just the data that is stored on them, right? And if that's all you're focused on, maybe, you know, that's where individuals think about, let's just scan it with antivirus. Well, that might work for just the data that is stored on it. But what's happening now is it's now the hardware is also a threat. So the hardware has a chip which has firmware, which interacts with the USB interface on your computer or the device, but it, it, it's trusted to advertise what it really is, right? We pr assume that it's a storage device, but it could actually masquerade and, and also operate as a microphone, as a network device, as a keyboard interface, or something else. And that's what's happening now is that USB portable media is not just a data threat anymore, it's also a hardware threat. And that's where, like you say, like Honeywell, um, we do have a technology in our secure media exchange that looks at both the data threat but also the hardware threat so that we can better mitigate this uh, risk while still being able to safely use USBs by the engineering maintenance and reliability teams. You know, ironically enough, the liability from the maintenance people that I talk to, their first point of concern usually is, is the cloud secure when they're moving data inside the plant up to the cloud? And I'm with you. My experience is that the threat vector actually is not the most in the cloud. It's the USB devices that might also be used to move data around and move documents around. Yes, we all have, you know, probably got four or five USB keys in my backpack as does everybody else that goes onto a site. So they're everywhere, right? And they're easy to use. And, you know, if you have a need, you're trying to get a job done, people pull them out. And so um, it, it's definitely another big uh, top of mind uh, thing for as we move into 2020 is how to deal with USB. Okay. Well, and we have time for one more question then, Donovan. Um, and we'll end with uh, what kinds of, tips or advice um, would you have regarding uh, cyber preparedness for our maintenance and reliability audience? Um, could be readiness detection, especially perhaps on the response side. Um, I want to change maybe to be to really um, where I see cybersecurity fitting in to our technology overall, right? So we think about um, the control systems and this technology, and we are becoming more and more dependent upon it to function and succeed, right? Uh, the control system, maybe advanced process control, uh, loop tuning, some of these advanced applications, the historian. Um, so as we, at some point in time, there was a justification or an ROI that was made to invest in that technology in the first place, right? So it was always under the premise that if we invest in this technology, which was the primary investment, then it will get that ROI. But let's think about what if it was taken away, right? Um, like for cybersecurity reasons, either somebody hacked in or ransomware or denial of service, and it was for not just hours, but potentially days. And, not, and I'm not talking about plant downtime or process downtime, but like the, the denial of your digital systems, right? The networks, the computers, the firewalls, and the data on them. Do you have workarounds and recovery plans, right? So I'm not saying you have to have those in place, but cybersecurity is one of the few domains 
of capable of having this impact, that if it's not addressed, then the ROI and the reliability and the expectations of the control systems and all that technology, they don't do their job, right? So that's how I see it. It's kind of like a supplemental or an enabler of that core technology. That's how I look at cybersecurity. And the other is it's a mindset that you must carry through the entire life cycle of the control system from its initial selection, design, configuration, commissioning, and maintenance, right? It's kind of like a safety mindset, right? So if you're on a construction site, you know, think of all the safety processes and procedures and PPE and tailboards and HAZOPs and daily kind of risk assessments that occur, right? So it, it's ensuring that we institute uh, safety as we're constructing. But um, we've not yet reached that level of mindset for cybersecurity, yet if we continue to depend on technology for everything we do, we really do, we really must change that thinking. So chances are the control system we have now, it's legacy technology, it was built or designed 10 or 20 years ago, so cybersecurity wasn't baked into it from the beginning. So we have to, um, you know, we're, we're mitigating that now, and then we've the, the, the kind of key takeaway is to leverage every opportunity um, from daily checklists, like, you know, when we're doing maintenance on the system, our maintenance procedures, leveraging unplanned outages, as well as our scheduled turnarounds to improve cybersecurity. Um, and that's kind of the, one of the key takeaways is that it, you know, a lot think that cyber can only be addressed if we do a total uh, systems replacement, and that's not true. We can make incremental improvement in changing the way we interact with the system, like simple things like um, we're going to upgrade the historian today. Well, let's use that opportunity to change the password, uh, install all the patches, do some vulnerability scanning, um, and see how it's going to behave. Let's beat it up so that when the new historian goes in, it's more secure than the old one. Right. And you that's what I mean by changing our thinking. No, I appreciate that. And it sounds it sounds like on days like that, uh, the item, these items should be added to the traditional daily safety moment, which kicks off the, the, the daily work meeting, which starts the day off. Just to remind everyone that this is a this is an operation. This is a task which will require, as you said, a, a comprehensive safety and security mindset. We have on the major projects where we've, you know, cybersecurity has been a, uh, a, a tenant of the project. Yes, we've actually started meetings with a safety moment and a mm -hmm. cybersecurity moment and remind everybody why we're doing this. And it's uh, a lot of the same practices that keep safety top of mind. They, they actually, surprisingly, they work really well for cybersecurity mm -hmm. as well. Well, that's brilliant. Donovan, thank you so much for being with us today and for the, the very powerful connection of safety with cybersecurity as well as what's coming for 2020. You're welcome. I, I enjoy the time and uh, the, the challenging questions and hope I'm, I'm able to help others as well. <laughs>